Christian Fossen is a professor also in physics, and um, he will now take the opportunity to grill uh, the other. Or I, I leave the word to you. Okay, have fun. Thank you, Anna. Uh, can everyone hear me like this? Sorry, David. That's my spot. Yeah, just... <laughs> Of course. No, um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, and uh, I think as a, as a scientist, that's, a, that's the greatest job you can have. But being a science consultant almost seems even cooler. So how did you actually get that job? Well, the nice thing about being a science consultant is I have the easier job than the writers because there's an infinite number of stories they can tell, right? But there's only one reality. I just to tell them what's true. So the, it was the writer's decision from the very beginning be, to bring in a science consultant to have the science right and have the... They could have made a choice, for example, of the characters being physicists but never have them talk about their jobs, which wouldn't be very realistic, but it's the way, for example, a lot of sitcoms work. I think, I think Ross is an archaeologist or an anthropologist on, on Friends, and that's the way they do it. This was a, so it was a creative decision, and I would never say that a production must have a science consultant. Uh, for example, if you were watching Star Trek, and they, if, which gets a lot of the science right, but if they had insisted that there be no such thing as warp drive, there would be about 40,000 episodes of them getting between planets and different <laughs> planetary systems where they just kind of looked at each other. It wouldn't be a very good show. So they reached out to, they just knew someone who knew someone. It was really quite haphazard, friend of a friend of a friend, and I was very happy that it landed on me. So it, it seems uh, unique to us to have a science consultant, really, to get the science right. But are there, are there other TV shows that also have science consultants? So, so we were wondering exactly the same thing. I was standing around with one of the production assistants while we were in between scenes watching the show. We were talking about how we both liked Breaking Bad, which is a show about a high school teacher that starts to make methamphetamine and gets himself out of jams using real chemistry. And we said, you know, I wonder if there's a... Uh, science consultant for that show. So we Googled it, and sure enough, uh, Professor Donna Nelson at the uh, University of Oklahoma is their chemistry consultant starting in the second season. So I wrote her a fan, ma I wrote her a fan mail. And uh, after communicating while well, she came to the show, as I said, it's performed in front of a live audience, and she came and watched, and the writers were big fans of Breaking Bad, so that was a lot of fun. And then together we also met uh, House, a medical drama, has a real physician, uh, Dr. John Sotos, uh, and so, lots of shows have uh, medical and science consultants. Right. So, uh, let's move to the, to the science of, of the Big Bang Theory. So, when I watch a show, I, I look for, for the science, and, and to me, it, it enters in, in three different ways. It's in the dialogue, where they, the, the characters typically sometimes mention a one-line sentence about something recent the scientific discovery, for example, like the dung beetles that we just heard. Mm -hmm. uh, it, of course, enters on the, on the whiteboards. Uh, and finally, sometimes the science makes it and sort of becomes the, 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 the main part of the storyline for, for an episode or even several episodes. So I'm curious about your, your role in, in all three of these aspects. So, so let's start with the, with the dialogue. Uh, so uh, sometimes a, a scientific discovery like, like the gravity the discovery of gravitational waves make, makes it into mm -hmm. the, the dialogue. So how does that actually, and, and very, very quickly, this can happen within weeks or even shorter, I think. So what's actually your, your record? The record there? might be about six days between the time that the cameras turn off and it's actually on the air in the US. That's, that's amazing. So how does that work? Do you get a, do you get a script? Right. So I get the script. Every day, every, every day during production, I get a script, sometimes twice. And, and a typical script's about 45 pages. But I wish I could have done my homework this way. The margins are about three inches of white space on each side, and they're quadruple spaced. So it's 45 pages like that. But still, it's a lot of work to put that together. And a lot of times, you know, as I said, the writers like science, and they'll just take a stab at it and put something in. And uh, other times, they'll just say, science to come, and put that in. And usually I'll get, and I, I don't know, sometimes they want language that people can sort of understand with some high school physics. Other times they want something that completely just sounds like gobbledygook. So I just give them a bunch of different, and they want short or long, I give them different options. In fact, I have a little sort of punctuation shorthand with one of the, uh, with the uh, script, uh, with the writer's assistant, who I send these to. And I put brackets around things that 
can be deleted, and I put curly braces around things to choose from, so I can write out something kind of in code, and he can make suggestions based on how long or short they want it. Okay. Uh, so I think m many scientists are a little bit afraid of, of getting their, their science out there because they know you need to do this in a short format, in easy language. You, you cannot display any of the details that we all find so incredibly important. Uh, so, so do you have any suggestions for us how to sort of reach out with the science in, in, this, in this way? You do it in one sentence sometimes. So, you know, it's one sentence that's out there. It's sort of the opposite of this program, Nova, where they one topic will go in depth, and it has a it's a great show and has its audience. I'm sort of hoping that people will uh, Google if they hear about dark matter or dark energy enough, they might be interested enough to search on it. Um, it's interesting as far as you know. I've never approached it from the direction of I want to get this particular topic out there. Usually, from the context of what they are looking for, something kind of pops into my head. Of that fits. Uh, and it goes back to what I was saying before. I think it's, if you have an agenda that you're trying to push for getting science out, I think it's actually, even though maybe what you want to do, I think it's a little hard because in the end, I think people can tell that's why you wrote this. Um, so may, I think maybe it's really just to get your, uh, your topics out there and somebody, when they're grabbing for something, may grab it. And I, I think the Nobel Prize, in fact, is a wonderful outreach tool. I, I love it when, for example, blue LEDs one, and people could say, oh, all right, physics impacts my life. So I guess the short answer to your question is if you want to get your science that you're working on out there in public is to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. I, I'm working on it. Uh, and actually, that's what you see on the, on the whiteboard right there. Uh, and so let's talk about the whiteboards. Um, so, as, as what's been mentioned now, they are, they are uh, impressively accurate and sometimes uh, topical. So, so, let's start with a poll of, of the audience. So, how many of you actually realized that what's on the whiteboards makes sense? <laughs> wow, see? It's pretty good. So, let's do another poll. How many actually recognized a set of equations on the whiteboard? <laughs> oh, there are still a few hands. So, that's a, it's a sport for me when I watch a show. I always try to figure out what's, what's on the whiteboard. Uh, and and my, my favorite is, is an episode where Raj and Sheldon are working together on dark matter uh, detection. And, and they, they work at the whiteboard and there's the music of the eye of the tiger being played. <laughs> uh, and the first line is about the differential cross-section for dark matter nucleus scattering, mm -hmm. uh, for spin-independent interactions. Can we have both? No, the second one is about the nuclear recoil. Uh, so, so I wanted to ask you: Do you have a do you have a favorite whiteboard? A fa oh my gosh, a favorite whiteboard. I just, I just well, this one thing popped into my head when you were talking about recognizing them, and I, I'm forgetting this this fellow's name right now. But I borrowed heavily from his work in plasma physics, and he's at the Princeton Plasma Physics uh, Center. And he he turns out he's a huge fan of the show. Did look at the one of the dozens of people out there that look at the whiteboards, and just saw his own work. And luckily, his first thought was not to sue us, <laughs> but uh, to to call his uh, public relations people at Princeton, and they made a whole newsletter article about his equations. So what happens if you make a mistake in the whiteboard? I did. I once hate I, mails? I once confused a sigma hyperon with a cascade hyperon. Yeah, I got... <laughs> I got some hate mail. <laughs> you got some hate mail. And if you look, you know, like a few episodes later, it's, it's up there again. It's fixed. We, I couldn't convince them to the episode or anything like that. I actually made a mistake on these whiteboards, uh, but I discovered it when we were discussing the whiteboard just before the show, so I had time to, to correct it. Uh, so maybe a final question. So as I said, sometimes the science actually makes it and becomes sort of the main, main storyline. So just as one example, at the, at the end of the seventh season, uh, the guys discuss the, the, I think it's the BICEP experiment mm -hmm. where they detect signs of gravitational waves on the cosmic microwave background. Right. Uh, and actually, as a side remark, that discovery was later explained in a different way. Right. Uh, and anyway, that, that sort of great scientific discovery uh, made Sheldon doubt his, his choice of study. He has been a string theorist for 20 years, and he thinks they have not made any, any progress. So he wants to 
change his, his field of study. And then there are actually several episodes about the, the troubles that he go through to, to do that. So, so how, how does, is this such an um, uh, episode written? How do you work together? Is this entirely the, the ideas of the, of the writers? Right, so anything that has to do with anything of meaning <laughs> comes from the writers. Yeah. So I, only stuff that doesn't matter. Is, but, so for, so for I, I, I get it. So that was an emotional beat that they wanted to, to explore and are still exploring what happened while he got off to work on dark matter, I think, ultimately, after trying a couple things, I think, including yes. gravitational waves. Um, and then uh, he got very excited about, in season nine, he got very excited about Leonard's idea that um, you, could, you could understand the vacuum of space and the origin of space-time by using superfluid helium as an analogy, which is an old idea, but Leonard had added on this idea that you could use the surface tension uh, in sort of a dimension minus one kind of argument. And so what's really cool about that is now they're, you understand why the two of them are friends, and they're working together. You know, so often they're fighting, you might wonder why they're friends. And the writers like that. I, the writers came up with that, obviously, and like that. They, and, that's not, and season nine is the first time we've had a multi-episode discussion of the same experiment. But I think that decision of, of giving up yeah, yeah, uh, that, your, yeah. your, your, dar Green, your darlings, yeah. basically, and, and changing field of sight, that's something that we scientists have to, to struggle yeah, with. So right. was, and that's one of the things we like about the show, how it really portrays these. And the amazing about writers is they understand us somehow, yeah. even if they haven't met us. Writers are so good at understanding people in different groups, they just pick it up like sponges, and so uh, that's their job. Their job is to play make-believe. Yeah all day, and they're very good at it. Okay, thank you, David. I think uh, we'll have a couple of minutes for, for questions from the, from the audience, if there's someone who has uh, a question for David. Wow, you asked everything. I asked everything. Okay. Oh, there's one, great. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, and I was wondering, I'm here for inspiration as well, <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if you, um, uh, if you, uh, for these boards, for instance, if you take someone like a Nobel Prize winner's board, uh, do you have to refer to that in the show, or could you, how could you deal with that? I mean, for other parts, if you write, you have to, oh, to oh, if it's someone else's idea or someone else's thought, you have to always ha do the refer to that uh, and quote and whatever. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, not, not exactly. No. Pardon? Like a yeah, do you have to reference to that if you, if you use some of the material that so someone is... So, uh... we tend not to um, use exactly... Well, it depends. So, we have used some... Uh, George Smoot, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery... He shared the Nobel, winning the Nobel Prize for the discovery that the cosmic microwave background was not perfectly smooth. It had some anisotropy in different directions, and, and that was expected and has been used to make great measurements about the early universe. Um, and he came to the show as Geek of the Week. And so I used diagrams of his apparatus and some of the equations that he had used. And I didn't think after being invited to the show that he would sue us. So in that case, I thought it was safe. Other times, though, it isn't, there's a, you know, it, once you have an idea, it's kind of out there. Okay. And uh, we use it, and, so, or we so modify it. Is that in the physics world? Because I'm not uh, uh, in this uh, world. But, but I was use it exactly. No, it's not exactly. So you can just do uh, similarly, or? So a great thing about science is that we don't actually own our science. Okay. When, once we put it out there, it's, it's, it's available. Free. <laughs> yes. Or Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Maybe I can just end then, because when, uh, in, this episode, in these episodes, when he changes his field of study, mm -hmm. he actually chooses between, between different, they give him various options. Well, that's right. And he dismisses basically all of them. And actually, one of them is, is yes, my field of yeah. study, <laughs> and Shellen actually makes a very mean remark. <laughs> <laughs> you but can least, blame me, I think, uh, for I that can, one. Thank you for that. Okay, at least I'm not a geologist because it's, they are even. I cannot go into the geology building at <laughs> UCLA, as, as Bill Prady says, they they might throw feldspar at me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, David. Thank you.